the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one good amen. Um, welcome everyone. How are you guys? And uh, pray you enjoyed your um, Thanksgiving. Uh, I pray it was a uh, blessed one with your family. Um, share my screen. I guess tonight we're going to start right away without uh, further ado. We have a lot to say tonight. And uh, as you all know, we're in the last couple of chapters from the Book of Revelation. Get ready to wrap up everything. Um, there is a um, request that was there last time to explain more in detail the. Um, the millennial kingdom or the understanding of a thousand year. I guess it was uh, confusing maybe for someone. Uh, so um, I don't know if you guys all have the same issue or it's only one person, um, but I will uh, rather to repeat the whole idea one more time very quick. Um, so we, we kind of continue in add up on this um, idea. Okay, so let's read the um, chapter 20, start from chapter 20 where this idea is there. Um, and that's what I said uh, at the beginning of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon that the serpent of old who is the devil, the devil and satan and bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished but after these things he must be released for a little while so just to be very clear, because that was um, confusing. We have locking down, if you can call it this way, for Satan in this place, which called here bottomless pet, for a thousand years, in which he cannot deceive the nations. Then after the thousand year ends, he will be released and it says here for a little while. So it's not a long time, but he never said how long. And I guess now after 20 chapters of the book of Revelation and the symbolic language, we can now understand what does it mean when he say a thousand year? What does it mean when I say a little while? And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And I want you to pay attention to this part because that will lead us to understanding what is a thousand years. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast of his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads, on their hands. And they lived, listen to that, they lived with Christ for a thousand years. These are the same thousand years when the devil was locked down. So don't get confused that we have two thousand years in a row. No, we're talking about the same thousand years. While the Satan is locked in the bottomless pit, those who follow with Christ, those who tolerated the persecution, those who, as he said here, were beheaded, even to the point of being killed as martyred, were reigning with him for the same thousand years. And that's very important to understand. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So there were some dead people there, but they did not live again. Listen, they did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So it looked like there were people there waiting for this thousand year to finish 
so they can start a new life. And he gave them the blessing. And we read that before. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, over which the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Again, we're talking about the same thousand years where they're reigning with him. Then listen, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his presence. That's what he was referring earlier as a little while. So after this thousand years, when uh, Satan will be locked down, when there will be people reigning with Christ, then after this thousand finish, the Satan will be released for a little while, and he adds here from his present, what was earlier called as bottomless pet. At this little while, he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners, meaning the whole earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So there will be a final scene, a final war, where, where the two teams will fight. That will happen in the little while. And it looks like fire will come from heaven. And the calm, fire will come down from, from God out of heaven and devour them. Then here comes the final uh, place for, for Satan. It says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. Now he's not talking about times anymore. Not thousand years, not a little while. He was talking about eternity forever. And after that, the final scene of the judgment will happen. Where, as it says here, I saw the dead uh, standing before God. The books will be opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. So this is the final judgment scene. Okay? This is the last day by the things with which were written in the books. And every, like, dead will come from everywhere. It says here, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And I will explain later what does it mean. I'm just trying to get the idea of the thousand year. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to refer to now. So they will, they will, the dead will give what it has. Death and Hades will deliver all also uh, what they were in them. And they were judged. Everyone will be judged. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, I read the whole chapter. Because this point needs to be very clear. This point, the point of um, the thousand years, looks like everyone is getting confused about this point. I want to repeat that again. Here, we're talking about a thousand years where a devil will be locked down for this thousand years. And I said that and I will repeat it again last time. There are two schools of interpretation for the thousand years. Two schools. One of them is the Orthodox Church that goes with the strictly symbolic meaning of the thousand years. No literal understanding of a thousand years. There's another interpretation of the thousand years that goes more into literal way, meaning that they're talking about a thousand year, a year of 12 months in a literal way. That yes, the Protestants follow this teaching right now, but they're not, it's not them who started this uh, interpretation. It started early in the church, even in the second church century. There were some, some uh, people who wrote about a thousand years. What exactly going to happen in this thousand year? What they were teaching and what the evangelical te church is teaching right now. And here comes the order, so people wouldn't get confused. And, and what will happen is that. At the end of the ages, that's what they're teaching, not our church teaching. Christ will come at a first coming where he will defeat ev 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 all the evil powers on earth. And he will live with his chosen people, what's been called the elect, for a thousand years. Then after this thousand year where devil will be under control, that's what they're teaching again. And I know a lot of people now cutting things and just stream it somewhere. So I have to be very clear that that's not our teaching. Some people do that. They will say that Christ will come, live in a thousand, literal thousand year on earth, and will fulfill all the, all the prophecies that I was talking about last, last time 
that in the Old Testament talking about a restoration for the nation of Israel, meaning the prophets were talking about what will happen when they come back from the exile and how they will start a new temple. And I will be referring to that today and how they will have a new nation. So all the evangelical churches says that Christ will come and listen to that, which that's very politic, politically important nowadays. Part of the thousand year that the Jewish people will believe in Christ and they will be first Jewish nation. Temple will be built in Jerusalem. They will start worshiping. Then their sacrifices are not going to be accepted. Then they will understand that Christ already came 2000 or whatever years before and they will believe. Then they will be part of this millennial kingdom. After the finish of this thousand year, as per teaching, there will be a rebellion of Satan and there will be a final war, a literal war between devil and the heavenly uh, like powers. And he will be defeated for good. Halas, that will be the last time. Then comes the judgment. This is the teaching of the evangelical teachings nowadays. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in that. We are called amillennialism. Like we're refusing the millennialism teachings. And we're strictly teaching of the symbolic understanding of the millennial kingdom. What does it mean? It means that Christ came already 2,000 years ago. He established a kingdom on earth. That's what we're praying every day. Thy kingdom come. Meaning that we're praying that Christ will come in our life. And we be part of this kingdom that already started with victory over Satan that already started with control of Satan that already started. St. Gregory in the first century said, the thousand years are the time of reign of Christ after the cross. As he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. That's John 12, 31. This is a verse. So St. Gregory, back like 17 years, 1700 years before, said that the thousand years are a time of reign of Christ after the cross. St. Ambrose, for a century as well. He said, those who lived with him are spiritually martyred in all eras and that the thousand years are not literal. That's what Ambrose is, is saying. Why do we refuse the kingdom on the earthly meaning? Why the, the Orthodox churches refuse the literal meaning of the millennial kingdom? For a lot of reasons. First off, we believe that the kingdom of God is not earthly thing. And we will be talking today, if God give us time, about a new earth, a new heaven. We do not inherit on earth. We don't have any uh, hopes on earth. And that's a language that's repeated a lot. You know, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. That's number one. Number two, Christ himself said that my kingdom is not, uh, not of this world. My servants will fight for me if it was. It's not. We never have hopes on earth. Um, this teaching of three comings, like the first coming of Christ when he was crucified, second coming to start this millennial kingdom, third uh, coming to do the final judgment is not anywhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible other than the symbolic message here. And we cannot base uh, as theology on a symbolic book and say, hey, the book of Revelation say that. We cannot do that. And there is no reference. On the opposite, the whole Bible is talking about one final uh, judgment, one coming for Christ in the second coming. This is part of the creed that we, we believe in the, um, the final resurrection, the one final resurrection where Christ will come again. That's very important to understand. Um, one more thing, all the prophecies that's talking about this Christ and people on earth has a reference about the, 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 the new kingdom in Christ. And again, I'll be talking about that when it, when it comes to the right uh, point to explain. So there is a refusal in our Orthodox Church to apply the literal understanding. Part, big part of the refusal has to do with the political understanding of the evangelical churches. And that's, that's what we see a lot in the U.S., how they try to help Israel, for example, to build a nation, how they try and them always to be a powerful nation. That's the Jewish Christianity. They're trying to teach that, hey, let's help the Jewish nation to come so they can understand that Christ is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Let's, let's get them part of our Christianity. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't teach that. That's very important. So this is, in summary, uh, the millennial kingdom. So for us at the Orthodox Church, 
the order of the millennial kingdom is and i'll just be very clear in order because i know i know it was confusing last time um the the order should be um that christ will come at the final day and this second coming will be um to to start the judgment meaning that christ will come at the end of the ages there will be a general resurrection where people who are dead will rise again as we as we're going to say today then there will be a last judgment then they will start eternity anything has to do with the thousand year is already in now we're already in this thousand year in a symbolic figurative uh, meaning and we fulfill all the prophecies of the old testament in this meaning as well i hope that the message is clear now and we don't have two thousand years it's only one thousand in a symbolic meaning that started after the cross and we're in now meanwhile while the devil is locked all people who died for him who lived for him will reign with him and this is the kingdom that we live in right now yes there is persecutions yes there are hard times and yes remember when he opened the fifth seal and how they were asking for uh, avenge yes we are asking for this avenge in a spiritual meaning asking for him to come and fulfill his kingdom and resist against all uh, the other um like powers in there i hope that the, the message is clear now then in verse three as we said how you know how he will be like unlocked for a while during this while and there's something need to be like kind of talking about a little bit during this release this is what the gospels are always talking about the hard times how the last days will be hard how like you know there will be a lot of like to the point that he said if these days are not going to be shortened even the elect are not going to be saved so that shows how hard are these days yes there will be hard days yes there will be a lot of persecution yes there will be a lot of troubles hardships that we uh, or the elect will go through but god will help God will shorten these days to make us or give us the power uh, to go through them and conquer and uh, reign with him in the final um, uh, day. Um, this is pretty much, and we, 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 we repeated a lot of these ideas last time, so I don't want to repeat it again, but I just wanted to clarify uh, the point of uh, the millennial uh, kingdom. Uh, we explained more also the Gog and Magog things that there's a lot of literal uh, explanation in evangelical uh, books about Gog and Magog. I said last time, there is a reference in Ezekiel 38. I hope that you guys read it. Ezekiel 38 is talking also about Gog and Magog. And all the father, with no exception, all the, like the early church, even those who believe in the like, millennial kingdom, never believe that this will be a literal thing. But it's more of um, world war where all the nation the even nations will be fighting against uh like the sons of god it's if you can call it an, like more of a like group of nation that's trying to uh fight the children of god but god will give them the power and that's the power will will, will be um like conquering with at the last days uh there is a, a strong uh message over here in verse 9 they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And it's, it's, a, it's a war language. See, it's like, like a navy and an air, you know, forces and land forces. It's like an alien, like, you know, group of nations that's fighting against uh, like God and his children in the tools that God used is fire from heaven and devoured them. And that's, a new, that's not a new idea that the fire from heaven is something repeated a lot in the Old Testament. We see it in Elijah. We see it in... Uh, um in the uh, when when solomon uh opened the temple so this fire is mentioned always when we have when we need a strong divine interference to declare truth from uh evil that's what we had uh there so um the, the starting from 10 verse 10 in this chapter we're talking about the final scene the final judgment i, I read i read these verses very quick again the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and prime stone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I, that's a part. The, the positive or the good part, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose face uh, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. That's a message of uh, Christ coming to judge. 
in the, the, the judgment language in the Bible is repeated a lot of times. Christ is the one who uh, will judge. For the Father judged no one, but he committed all judgment to the Son. And in other places, he says, I, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and at his kingdom. That's St. Paul. So the language of Christ being the, the, the one in charge of judgment is very strong in the Bible. That's what we see here, that the one who is sitting on the white throne, Christ, because he is the one who saved and he is the one who has the right to judge those who never believed in his salvation. That's very strong message. Then here comes the final judgment. And he said, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened. So it's kind of, what did you do? It's books where all our lives will be written in. My life will be, will be written in a book. There's a page that calls Abuna Daniel in it. Okay, the page says he was born in this time. He did that. He did that. He, he offered repentance and his sins were forgiven. And he, you know, so there is, a, you know, there's services that he did. And as the Bible says, okay, what did you do to my little uh, brothers and sisters? How much help did you give? How much, you know, if someone was hungry, did you feed him? If someone was thirsty? in all aspects, like being responsible spiritually and socially and like even physically for, for my church, I'll be asked, what did you do? There were some people who are hungry, people who never have money. Did you help them? You know, the people who were, were in need, did you help them? People that were stressed, did you relieve them? So I'll be asked personally about these, those people's life. And that's what's written in the book. And every one of us will have the same, will have a book. And in the books, we'll be asking about the talents that we were given as well. You were given one, two, three. You know, you have a nice voice. How far did you go? You're smart. How, uh, you know, how, how did you use your mind? Well, you're, you're, uh, you have like health. How much you use this health? You know, you have your parents. How much did you help them? You have like your neighbors. How did you treat with them? And so on. But all the talents that we were given in life will be written in these books. And in these books, we'll be asked, you know, what did you do? So there, there, but it, the, the relieving message uh, that the temple said in Romans, which is I love, there is therefore now that St. Paul, uh, Romans 8, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is a very nice message, a very relieving verse that's talking about no condemnation for those who are in Christ for those who are in Christ. And this verse is great because it also fulfills both aspects, faith and works. He says, those who are in Christ Jesus, like they believe in Christ Jesus, and those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So their actions, their, their deeds, their, their works are in Christ, in spirit. It cares more about spirit, it cares about their prayer, their, you know, relationship with Christ, their service, their, their, their Christ-like, they help everyone out there. That's what he means here with the books written. And there will be, uh, and by the things which were written in the books. There's some mysterious verses coming now. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Imagine, imagine everyone were dead in the sea will come, the waves will sh sh like, you know, throw them in the beach. Of course it doesn't mean that. And again, we're in a symbolic book, so it doesn't mean that. What does it mean that the sea will give up the dead who were in it? Um, and death and Hades will del deliver up the dead who were in them. What does it mean? There's a lot of meanings, but just the easiest one. Remember, we always say that the sea is the world. So those who are in the sea, the Father said that those who are still alive, they're still in the world. And those who will be delivered to judgment. And those who are dead will rise again to be judged. So we have two parts, two types here. When he come in the final coming, there will be two types. Those who died, which will be billions and billions of people since Adam till the end of the world. And those who are already alive. And those also what's called here that they are in the sea. So the sea meaning those who are alive and the, those who are in death or Hades, those who uh, well died already. Uh, who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his work. It's so frightening how each one, and he insisted, each one, it's a separate uh, judgment. You cannot take anything with you. You cannot take, I'm sorry, you cannot take anyone with you. 
can say that, you know what, I'll, I'll use my, my husband, and you know, I'll use my children or whatever. It doesn't work this way. Each one, as it says here, according to his works. That doesn't mean that we don't believe in fellowship. We don't believe that, you know, yes, people will, will now, they have a chance to help each other, to support each other, to encourage each other and so on. But at this day, each one will be according to his uh, works. That's very important. It, it, then the last couple of verses says, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Death itself will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What does it mean? Uh, it means that there will be no death anymore. Khalas, there, you know, that's a final. There is no death anymore. Until this day, there will be people alive and dying, and there will be, you know, then another people are born and another people will dying and so on. But here, death and Hades were cast in Khalas. There is no more death. There are no more Hades. There is only two places, heaven and Hades. There is no, uh, like, you know, places where, I'm sorry, heaven and, and hell. There is no, like, Hades as a waiting place and, and all this like paradise and all these meanings. No, there were only final destination because everything now is a temporal one, even in heaven. It's like, it's not in final yet, but everyone knows where he's going. It's like, you know, as the fathers always say, you know, someone is really did, did good in his exam and he knows, you know, what, you know, that he's, he's, he's gonna pass versus others who know that their life were miserable, full of sin, and they never believed in him, and they even denied his name, and they were like teaching everyone, you know, what are you talking about? There is no such a thing as religion. There is no such a thing as God. There is no such a thing as, uh, as Christianity. There is no such a thing as a church. And all the teaching that we're surrounded with right now, those who are, they know. They know that they, you know, they never believed in him. And I'm not so much interested into, you know, asking the very common question, okay, there are people who never heard about, you know, God, there's people who like never had the chance to be born like that. And like, you know, I don't know. I don't think anyone can answer this question. The only thing we know that God is merciful and that God is, is, uh, is just. So as much as he is merciful, as much as he's just, I don't know how God will judge those who never have a lot, those who never get exposed to the word of God a lot. All what I know that God is merciful and God is just, and he will give everyone the way of salvation. So at the end of the day, no one will be able to open, as the Bible says, open his lips. He cannot say anything. All the mouths will be shut before his throne because he will give everyone and be able to judge uh, everyone. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So just as the father says, we're all written in the book of life. And that's what Moses said. When Moses were arguing with God in the Old Testament, he says, you know what? It is my name from the book of life. So it's already there. But, you know, he was just like kind of arguing with God to save his people and to keep them and like give him another chance. So it's very important to know that our names are already in the book of life. When we get baptized, we have this. And there's a lot of nice prayers in baptism that's talking about how we are born from heaven, how we are, you know, of heaven. And we have to understand this fact so we enjoy. And we keep these names by our faith and by our works to stay in this um, book of life. Um, then we run into chapter 21 because it's continuing the same uh, final scene. But from now on, there is no talking about sin or death or whatever. It will be pure uh, heavenly image. As I said last time, we have two chapters in Genesis 1 and 2. And we have two chapters in Revelation 21 and 22 where there is no mention about death. So the beginning was perfect and the, the end was perfect. And it's very interesting how you can do a lot of comparison. And that's a very great point of study. If you guys, I know you guys have a lot of time. And, you know, I know that we have time. Like, when Corona and, like, we don't have any, like, such a thing. Why not you guys do a comparison between Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22? Every single word here in the Revelation can be compared to something in Genesis 1 and 2. Make a very big table and compare what's in there, what's in there. We'll try to find some here now. But I, I'm sure that you still can find a lot. Let's read. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Remember that. There will be no more sea. Then I, I John, he's, he's confirming who's talking still. Because he said that a while ago. Now he's repeating again. Then now I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down coming out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned with her husband. And I heard a voice. So, so the first thing that he saw, then he heard. First, he saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Then he starts to mention what does it look like to be with God. So let's stop here, and then we can explain in details their condition staying with God. How do they will look like when God will be with them? So these few verses actually are, are great uh, verses to read. And um, it has a lot of references. We all know that there, there is an old earth, an old heaven, the ones that we live in right now, the one that was created in Genesis 1 and 2. And um, it's, it's very nice that St. Peter says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. Yet, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. That's what St. Paul said in Hebrew. They will perish. So the Bible is repeating this message again, that the, the earth and heaven will fled, will fled away. They're, they're, they will be destroyed. So the first heaven, the first earth that we are living in right now, will be destroyed, starting a new one. And this message, and remember when, she, when Jesus said heaven and earth will perish, you know, when he was talking about how the, the word of like, his mouth is there, and his, you know, the, his word will never, will never uh, go away. He says heaven and earth will perish. So this message is not new in the book of Revelation or even the Gospels. This message was repeated a lot in the Old Testament. Remember when I said that we're, we're quoting a lot from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, a lot. And now we're going back to another quote from Isaiah 65. Let me read it. It's an amazing uh, part. It's repeated here. Isaiah says, quote, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, unquote. So Isaiah used the same language, saying that they will, I will create new heavens. And it's the only difference here that in the Isaiah, he mentioned it in plural. He says, create new heavens and a new earth. Here, I don't know the original language, how it looks like, but it's, it says a new heaven and a new earth. But anyway, what we can compare here, which is very interesting, like I said, between uh, Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. Very interesting. How did the new, the first, heaven the first earth were good remember when god says look and says you know what I, you know all what i did was good sin was not there satan were not even mentioned at this moment and because the the, the adam were in good status everything was good then when sin entered this goodness started to disappear and this and listen to this verse this heaven and earth the first one had to come to an end they cannot continue. There has to be replaced. Why? Because they get into corruption. That's what St. Paul said in Romans 8. Here, I have a puzzle, and I'm trying to put pieces from different verses. It's a hard topic. But in order to understand it, we have to collect verses from right and left. So I mentioned what Isaiah said. And I mentioned what Genesis 1 and 2 said. Now I mentioned what St. Paul said. What St. Paul said, quote, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with first pains together until now. Unquote. So what St. Paul is saying here, that what the creation that we live now, it groans with it full of pain. It has a lot of problems. Part of it is a COVID thing. There's a lot of troubles out there. Creation is not perfect. It's full of deficiencies. It's full of problems. There's earthquakes, volcanoes. There are people are dying here and like, you know, tornadoes. And yeah, it wasn't like that before sin. Yes, part of the fruits of the sin, we can say, was this corruption of the nature. 
And that happened because of the disobedience. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel again, always when they were prophesying to the nation of Israel, saying, you know what? Your disobedience to, to God as chosen uh, people will not only lead to your corruption, but it also will lead to rejection of the whole world because you were chosen to be representative of the whole world. When you disobeyed God, the whole creation is spoiled now. It's not, it's not in a perfect status. That's why Isaiah was looking to the coming messianic kingdom where he described a vision of a new heaven and new earth. That's very important to relate the new coming. But what's characteristic about this new heaven and earth, that there is a lot of exclusion of bad things from it. And I will mention here what's coming because it's very important to mention it here. This new heaven and new earth, there will be no more sea. Why? Because sea is, as we said before, full of, you know, changes. It's not constant. Waves come and waves go and it's always like getting crazy. Um, also, sea, when you read in Genesis, it separates continents, right? The water was separating the earth from each other. But there will be no separation anymore. There will be no more nations like separated from each other, will be one nation in heaven. So there's no point of having sea anymore. That's why he says here, no more sea. Why no more sea? Because the sea was dividing nations, dividing continents. In heaven, in the new heaven, in new earth, it will be, they will, everything will be stable and everything will be one. And we said before also, the sea is more of thirst. You know, we will not be thirsty anymore. So he excluded sea. He excluded later on crying, mourning, pain, death, and all, you know, evil, wicked people, even, imagine, later on, he would be, there would be no more temple. Why? Because temple was a representation to represent the existence of God. You know what? God is already there. He doesn't have to be represented by the temple. It doesn't, doesn't have to be an altar. There doesn't, what, because he's there. He's there. He excluded the existence of a sun or a moon or all these shining things. Why? He's there. He's lightening the whole uh, place for us and that's great there would be no no more satan remember satan in the story of job when he was trying to kind of uh be against job it's, it's not going to be like that anymore because he is not going to be there he will be judged already until the end then in verse three the nice thing talking about i love this verse actually and you know what it's very very nice to talk about it nowadays when we're talking about christmas and nativity because it's a very nice verse uh talking about the tabernacle tabernacle behold the tabernacle of god is with men and in arabic he doesn't use the word tabernacle it was never translated as tabernacle the ul who was a mask on allah it's it's as if he says the dwelling of god with men and he will dwell so in arabic he said it's a dwelling and he will dwell but in english he's a tabernacle and english is very nice using the word tabernacle and even St. John, use, use, when he says that Logos, for the word, the word will take flesh, he took flesh and tabernacled among us. You, can, you might find it in your version as dwelled among us. Other translations said tabernacled among us. I love how the fact that the tabernacle in the Old Testament is a great example of incarnation. Christ come and took flesh and dwelled among us. And that would be fulfilled 100% in the uh, heaven. It's not going to be just a, a, a symbolic meaning or, or a flesh uh, existence where we see Christ walking. No, he will be with us. And the coming messages uh, will be actually coming back and forth. One more thing, and I know I'm taking a lot from right and left, and it's, it's so overwhelming maybe, but I loved when I read that. because. Going back to the exile era in the Old Testament and how the prophets that I was talking about were prophesying about a coming of a new era, what they were talking about, the restoration, the remnant. There will be people coming from exile and a new era will start. You can read that a lot in Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, in the minor prophets. And them with, with Malachi are the last three uh, prophets. I was reading in Haggai, and there's a very, very strong verse 
that's very related to what we're talking about right now. Listen to what he says. He says the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And I was reading, and no way. The, the temple, the house that they built when they came back from the exile, were no, by no means greater than the glory of the former house, meaning the one of Solomon. No, it was a weak one, smaller one, less glorious one. That was not, it's not, definitely it's not like Solomon house. So why he says here that the present house will be greater than the glory of the former house? Well, there is no gold and silver as there was in the first one. Why he said it's bitter. And the moment I read there's no more silver and gold, I'm like, oh my God. Remember when John and Peter were walking in the temple and the lame man came to them and he says, you know what, give me something. And they look at them, at him and says, silver and gold, I do not have. They were in the temple. And as if they're referring to the temple, says, silver and gold, we do not have. This new house, this new temple has no silver and gold. But we know we have what's more glorious, as Haggai says, what's greater than the glory of the former house. We have the name of Christ. And in the name of Christ, they helped him and they healed him. And definitely, we're not talking about physical healing here. We're talking about the new glory of the new temple. Remember Christ when he was talking with, with the Pharisees and they were showing the greatness of the temple and because he wanted to give them the same message, you know what? Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And they used this accusation against him in, in the crucifixion time. And he said that he will, uh, you know, destroy the temple and rebuild it. And he said, they even said that we built it in 46 years and he want to build it in three days. I'm like, are you fool? I'm not even talking about this temple. I'm talking about the new temple. What the one that Haggai said that would be greater. So this temple that he's talking about here, the tabernacle, the existence of God himself, the name of Christ that we have right now is far greater than any temple that the Jews have or the old nations have. That's what we have. And this is what he says here, that he will dwell with them and they shall be with his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Whoever started that here will have it in eternity. But if you didn't start it here, you will have no knowledge for him. So that's the new uh, temple, the new tabernacle that we have in heaven. Then he started to explain what are the features of this new heaven. Because he says, okay, the new heaven, as he described earlier, have the existence of God. He says that she's like, it's a like a bride adorned with her husband. Yes, but what will happen? There was no sea and all these things. But how does it look like? And here comes a very relieving and comforting message. A very nice one, actually, uh, to read in these hard days. When he says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear, um, it will be wiped. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I love this verse. The former things have passed away. Then he continues and said, then he sat on the throne. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Can you please put two of these verses together? The former things have passed away. I make all things new. And he said to me, an order, write for these words are true and faithful. Whoever is good and counting, please count how many times he says right. It's, you know, that's your homework. So that's how they look like. How do they look like? First off, he is with them as a husband and wife, as he said earlier. Um, he will wipe away all the you know, tear, tears, from their, tears from their eyes. And that's a good sign of comfort from all pain and sufferings. And what I also loved, um, how uh, he he's like swallowed the death. So he says there is no more uh, death. Death uh, shall be no more death. I like I like the fact that here we're dealing with the fact that death is coming. No way, it will come. We know every one of us will go through that. But when you're in a place where you know that no more death, eternity, that's a very relieving message. So he will swallow up death. That's Isaiah as well. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all their faces. Imagine 
exactly the same verses that John is using was in Isaiah 25. This one for 25. I repeat it again. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. I will encourage you guys. If you never read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, it's time to start. After the book of Revelation, I think you can have a very nice um, vision about them. Um, then there will be no sorrow. And I like the order that he put it here. He says, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. Why these three things? Sorrow, because sorrow usually says from, you know, when you lose something, oh, I lost something, I lost a job, I lost some, you know, money or whatever, there will be no more losses. So there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying, because crying more when you can go through a hard time, you know, like persecution, maybe like, you know, feel like bad, that's not going to be there anymore. There will be no more pain, because pain is more of physical, you know, disease or like disability or anything that we have. That's not going to be there anymore. And another nice comparison that I think we can uh, have over here is a comparison between Jerusalem and Babylon. Remember, in like a couple of chapters, and that was the theme for a couple of chapters, like, you know, I guess maybe 15, 16, when he was talking about Babylon, the harlots, right? Remember, it's a good comparison to have between Jerusalem and Babylon. Jerusalem that's descending from heaven, Babylon that has like fumes coming up, like, you know, like a, like a fume coming up from, from earth. In Jerusalem, we see a lot of, you know, tears wiped away. Babylon were, were, was full of tears. Jerusalem, there's no pain, no sorrow, no crying. Babylon was full of tormentment and suffering and crying. Jerusalem was a bride to a groom. And that's how, like, adorned and how it looks beautiful. In Babylon, it was described there's no voice of pride and groom, remember? In Jerusalem, it was a dwelling for God was, 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 was men. Versus in Babylon, it was the harlot, right? That has an affair with the kings of earth. So it's 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 a it's a very nice comparison that we can think about, and also the best comparison ever between the former things that passed away and the new things that he uh, did. Um, then he ended with the words are true and faithful, and that was mentioned in chapter nineteen as well. If you can go back to it, I think nineteen nine. Um, these are the true sayings of God, and. I, we we explained that uh, at this moment saying how truthful is the word of God and how we can trust his promises uh, always. Then he continues and says, and he said to me, it is done. It is done. These are the words that Jesus Christ used on the cross when he says, it is done. It is completed. Salvation was done and now it's repeated again as done because this uh, life with all what it has is done and now it's time to start eternity. I am the Alpha and Omega, uh, the beginning and the end. This Alpha and Omega we explained before in chapter one, because he used the same words, the beginning and the end. And back, the, back then, we said that it's very important to use the language that we understand. Like, you know, like when, when, when it's explained in Arabic, they say, Al -alif -ul -ya. in other languages, they, they use their, all, you know, A and Z. So it's good how God uses a way that we can understand uh, they use the same words, and that's what we've been in in the last 20, uh, 21 chapter, using the human language to explain the divine things that is hard for us to understand. Um, then a nice verse as well, when he said, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Very nice, very nice. This uh, idea and picture of the fountain of water of life, giving freely to him who thirsts. Um, I have a few things to say over here. It might be the concluding verse, maybe. Um, when he says those who thirst, that will take us to the beatitude. Remember in, in, in Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Here you go. Here you go. Those who hunger and thirst for the righteousness, those will be given the fountain of water of life. And that's exactly what Jesus used when he was talking with the Samaritan woman as well. It's very important how it's a, it's a like, you know, um, giving water, they give us to be filled. There's no more thirst. But the word that needs to be explained, I think, over here is freely. Why he says freely over here. And this is a great verse for everyone thinks that he can earn the eternity or you know like you know the uh kingdom of god by his own works no way we can't by our works only no way that's that's a message that we repeated a lot 
all the works that we can do without the name of Christ, without his grace, cannot go us anywhere. But just to fulfill, to make the idea very clear, if you continue the next verse, he says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. I love how every single time you talk about grace, you find right away a verse about the works and how you can react to this grace. So why he says freely? Freely, because you cannot compare it with, with what you get. All what we do in our life cannot be compared with eternity. So definitely, in comparison, it's free gift. Number two, that we get a victory. And this victory is not conditioned. We don't pray, so we conquer over sin. We don't like uh, go to church, so we, be, we become sense. It doesn't go this conditional relationship. It's a grace. It's a gift that God gave us. But we have to react to this grace by overcoming, as he says in the next uh, verse. Plus, the last point is our striving or works or whatever we do is time limited. How much are you going to work? 70, 80? How much are you going to give you? Eternity. So this comparison is not balanced. And that's a great idea of the free grace that he gave us. But the response here, he who overcomes shall inherit. So there is a striving. There is work that has to be done as well. So we can overcome, so we can inherit the things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. The sonship idea is a very nice idea to also think about nowadays in the incarnation time and nativity time. Uh, the idea that the gift of the sonship that we uh, got from the incarnation is a great thing. He says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. And that's what St. John said also in the first chapter. He says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So that's a gift, of course, to become children of God. Uh, verse 8, um, we can continue. Um, he started to go with the negative aspects. See, he started to talk about those things are excluded from this heavenly scene. Those last are, has to be out. And he gave a long list of sins that leads to second death. Not there anymore. He says, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and prime stone, which is a second death. Here, he gives a long list of those who are excluded from heaven. And that's actually uh, something that can be explained in detail. I think we can do that uh, next time. Because right now, I don't think we will have enough time to, um, to like, go through one by one. Because I want to refer to some, to some points uh, in this uh, list. I think it's very important to uh, understand what he means by unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars as well. That's a very important message that we have to explain. I wish if you guys have a question or a couple of questions that we can go through in the next couple of minutes. Abuna, why God will destroy 